Everybody, how are you doing today? Yes, uh, this is the last video. This is part four on the podcast where Steve is talking about exciting things. And so we're going to get right into it. All right, everybody, welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back to my channel. I'm glad you could join me. Uh, Steve is uh, excited about the year 2023. Um, and so he that's what he's going to talk about. Uh, he was asked what is really exciting him about 2023. And he's going to talk about that. So let's get into it. And I would imagine that these efficiencies are one of the reasons why, let's say, the Aptera can charge up to 150 miles overnight on a regular household outlet instead of, you know, like when I've plugged my Tesla in and in dire need and I've gotten, you know, like 40 miles overnight or 50 miles overnight if I'm lucky. It's not because the batteries in, in Aptera are like magical and just can charge that much faster. It's because we're able to go so many more miles on the same amount of charge because of things like the 0.13 drag coefficient or the fact that it's so much lighter and smaller and more aerodynamic than a larger car like a Tesla Model 3 or a Model S. That's it exactly. I mean, that's it. You hit the nail on the head. The same outlet you plug in your cell phone, you're going to get 150 miles overnight because we just need less power to go the same distance, less energy. That has a trickle-down effect, you know, and you're going to be waiting less at the charger. When you go to supercharger, you'll be there, you know, a third, a quarter of the time compared to your counterparts and other vehicles. You'll be able to charge 150 miles overnight just from plugging in the 110 outlet. So, and it'll be even faster in Europe with the 220 volt and the power that they have. My English friend always laments how long it takes as a water to boil in an American kettle versus a kettle in the UK where they have 220 volts. You know, it's almost instantaneous, but here, you know, it takes a long time to boil. But that's it. You're going to spend less time charging. You're not going to worry about it as much. Even with the solar, you're probably not going to have to plug it in some months of the year, maybe at all, but maybe throughout the year, just every week or every month, depending upon how you drive. So you're not tethered in the way that you are with the typical EV, like with my Bolt. I mean, Bolt's a fine little runabout car. I've, I've got a, one on lease. But the other day, I'm going overseas as part of a business trip, and I was told that my passport has no empty pages, so they couldn't put the visa in it for the country I'm going. I had to get a new passport, and I need to drive to Santa Monica right away. And I ended up printing out the documents and having to FedEx them up there. They got there the next day because I just I couldn't drive up there and back one day with my vehicle without having to spend an inordinate amount of time charging. Not only charge to go up there because I didn't have a full charge, but then to get back. And so I risked, you know, now I've delayed my passport by a day, and it might hopefully get here the day before I leave. But that's just a real world example of like when you're tethered to power and tethered to electricity, like you are with most conventional EVs, it's still a factor in maybe you deciding at the spur of the moment to go up to Los Angeles and back or something like that, because you just know how long it's going to take you to charge or if it's even possible. Right. That's a really good point about it having almost a cascading effect on spontaneity. I have a, a dog now. <laughs> I've had him for about four years. I love him to death. He enriches my life in so many ways. He's sleeping right behind me. He's a little lazy, but I try not to knock him. But with having him, right, like there's an aspect of spontaneity that kind of just diminishes, right? Because I can't just be like, oh, you know, I'll stay out all night or I'll just go on a, a trip this weekend. I have to plan around my dog, you know, who I love to death. But there's a huge difference between taking on a dog, a liability that I gladly accept, and a car, right? Like you shouldn't have to think of a car like a liability that eats into spontaneity. That's a really good way to put it. The spontaneity, yeah, and we just did the same thing. You know, our, our family, as if we didn't lose enough spontaneity having two children, we added to that by getting a dog a few months ago. Uh, and so uh, you're absolutely right. I hadn't thought about it in terms of spontaneity really until the example of the passport, even your dog. But that, I mean, that is exactly it. The more energy that you have to carry and 
the faster rate that you need to charge, you know, is really inversely proportional to the spontaneity that you'll have. That's a my engineering way of looking at it. So you remove those things and you increase spontaneity. I think that's one of the things that we do. Staying focused on design for a second, in a recent video posted to Aptera's YouTube channel, announcing that the company's solar panels were in production, one of the featured employees said, quote, solving the problem of solar for the Aptera, which is generally considered one of the more challenging and novel aspects of the vehicle, means that we've gotten one of the most challenging parts of the vehicle out of the way, end quote. So I guess, why was developing solar panels for the Aptera such a difficult problem to solve? And why was it so important to get it absolutely right? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> when uh, Anuj, the young man Anuj, who heads the solar team, when we hired him, we joked that, you know, we just gave him a, a credit card and, and some sketches and some prototype things that we made, locked him in a room and said, here, go figure this out. And he did. There was no automotive grade curved solar panel that we could find or that was available for Aptera to be used in the way that we wanted to use. So we we actually tracked down an application of curved solar cells, which was from the plane, the solar impulse, the solar plane that flew around the world. We found the company that bought that, got contact with the CEO. He came out to meet us and we said, look, you know, we're, we're not competing with you. You're, you bought the rights to this plane. You're working on solar aviation. We're trying to make automotive stuff. But you know, would it be possible for us to talk to your engineers and, and see the kind of challenges that they overcame? And then we'll share with you what we learned. And what we learned was that the Airbus engineers that designed that plane, they had no idea or no thought put into longevity. They just said, can we bend these in two dimensions and laminate them in fiberglass and make that the surface of the wing? And they were like, yep, we can do it. Okay, let's build it. And that was it. So they have no idea how many of those panels or cells are cracked or how well they're performing how many years they would last in the sun. You know, there was no attendance given to that because it had a very fixed duration mission. And the reason I cite that is because that was, you know, one of the most prolific uh, examples of sort of curved solar panels used in, in transportation. So after that phone call, we realized that we're just in new territory. There was nobody doing it. You know, there was no one coming to save us. And that meant that we had to really start with first principles from the kinds of materials, you know, how do we achieve strength? How do we achieve UV resistance? How do you test and even see if you have micro cracks? And Maxion, uh, the cell manufacturer, has been really helpful in, in helping, you know, guiding our team and thinking through some of these issues that we've discovered. But even, you know, Maxion is quite open and been very helpful and supportive, but they recognize that we, you know, Aptera is just in, in really virgin territory. And it's because the team has spent so much time and effort in building this body of knowledge and we're able to make these panels. So the challenge for automotive is you've got vibration, you've got, you know, softballs, hail, hot, cold water. You've got all these things that really work on these polymers over time. And you have to attend to that and the material science and the preparation, the different treatments and chemical treatments that you may do with certain materials, et cetera. It's a new body of work to make a curved, lightweight automotive solar panel that can withstand the rigors of automotive use. Yeah, I can only imagine what an entirely different problem to solve it is when putting solar panels on a car versus a roof of a house. I mean, obviously... A roof is subject to the elements, but not in the same way at all as a car. I guess this is more of a general question, and perhaps this is too far into the future, but because you're so knowledgeable about solar and because you and your team have been trying to solve this problem recently, do you see a near future in which you're able to make the solar panels that are across the Aptera and on the body of the Aptera less visible or perhaps not even visible to the human eye? So they blend. It looks like they're just part of the vehicle and you can't even see them unless you're looking really closely. Yes and no. There are other materials and methods that I would say we're not exploring with great vigor because we're hyper-focused on just getting this vehicle to production. But we are aware of different pathways we could go in the future that might do that. But I would say it's just not an area of exploration that takes up any of our time right now because the team is just hyper-focused on building these panels for production. At the moment, I don't see how that can be done on a color basis. You know, the color of the cells is kind of a function of the wavelengths that it absorbs. I don't know of a way that we could be able to change it and make it different colors, but smaller cells and different materials that allow us to make larger panels without the sort of faceted cells or something that we could look at in the future. But, but right now we're focused on the Maxion solution and getting those panels into production. Understandable. I'm asking a rather luxury question, and you're trying to solve a rather working class problem, which is <laughs> how do we move this vehicle into production? 
You know, I would be remiss if I didn't ask this question, especially for some of our listeners who are new to the vehicle. And I'm trying not to call it a car because it really isn't one. It's classified, like you said, almost like a motorcycle because of its three-wheel design. So traditionally, a three-wheeled vehicle is less stable than four-wheeled vehicles. And I think anyone who was once a child, which I imagine is everyone listening, who has ever owned or ridden a tricycle can speak to the relative instability of a three-wheeled vehicle, right? Top Gear even featured a three-wheeled vehicle once. It was known as the Reliant Robin, which had one wheel in the front and two in the back. And that vehicle flipped constantly. So obviously, Aptera has two wheels in the front, one wheel in the back. But on behalf of the listeners, like how is Aptera accounting for this? And for any hesitant potential customers out there, why shouldn't they be worried? The number of wheels a vehicle has is just one element in its margin of stability and center of gravity. You know, there are lots of four-wheel vehicles, many SUVs or crossovers or things that don't have the same stability of, let's say, a Tesla Model 3 or something with the battery pack in the bottom, even though they both have four wheels. So mathematically, we achieve the same rollover stability and center of gravity of a typical small vehicle like a Volkswagen Golf. I would say mathematically, if you were to look at the center of gravity and margin of stability of those two vehicles, Aptera and the Golf, they would be very similar. So we're able to do that with three wheels because at the end of the day, it is just really math and physics that determine that number of wheels is a factor. It becomes easier to do it with a fourth wheel, for sure. So Aptera has to work very diligently to move weight forward and around in certain areas. But it is, at the end, just math and science, and it lets us get the same margin of stability of many popular small vehicles today. And you can see that on the track, I think, in some of the videos, if people go online to Aptera's YouTube channel and see the moose test. I mean, there's a lot of passenger cars that can't even pass a moose test. Uh, you can see us doing moose test and uh, drag racing uh, Audi R8s and, and stuff like that and see that the vehicle is, is quite stable. What is the moose test? It's a test developed in Sweden. I don't know if it's by the Swedish government or Volvo, but moose accidents are quite a thing up in that part north of the Arctic Circle. And so to be able to avoid one at high speeds, they tend to wander across a highway, is very important from a safety perspective. So it's basically making a very sudden turn at high speed to avoid an object and return in the lane without the vehicle becoming unstable or flipping. Oh, oh, today I learned. I, <laughs> I suppose if I was a native to Canada, I would know what the moose test is. Right. <laughs> but we don't get many moose down, in, down here in Los Angeles. That's right. Unless they're on a film set or CGI. So, Steve, I want to be sensitive to your time. I've really enjoyed our talk today. And, of course, it would be great to have you back perhaps in 2023 once Aptera is rolling into production because I could talk your ear off for another hour with all the questions I have. As we're heading into 2023 and as Aptera is about to enter full production, two questions kind of related. What is, in your view, the biggest production challenge that you and your team are working on now as you take Aptera into production? And what's one of the things you're most excited about with Aptera your team and the company moving into 2023? So it's kind of a two-pronged question. What's one of the more difficult things you're anticipating with production? And what's something that you're just really excited about with the company heading into the new year? The most difficult thing, it's that last little bit of design work. We're at like 99% lockdown of design. And it's that last 0.1% that feels like it's just taking an inordinate amount of time. And it's just the way it is. There's nothing that can be done about it. And so, you know, seeing where we can spend money and add people to speed things up or things that can't be speeded up, that's the most frustrating. Things that are just going to take a certain amount of time, you know, even if you had a truckload of money to shovel into it, those are the frustrating things. Usually those are things that are outside of our control, you know, done by outside parties or agencies. The second part of your question, uh, the most exciting thing about 2023, I think it's just that, is you're going to see all this come together and seeing a real tooled Delta production vehicle come off the assembly line next year. And every facet, every single part made by a tool, precise, fits like it should for a factory produced vehicle. And then they're just going to start coming off the line. And seeing that first one, I think, is just going to be incredible because it literally will have been our, our modern lifetimes and two separate attempts you know, spent to get to that part. And once we see it, I think that'll be a massive, not a sigh of relief, but just a sense of completion, kind of turning the page of that chapter and now just focus squarely on increasing production, different variants, looking at different parts of the world. It'll be just a whole new way of looking at the company. 
Yeah, I can only imagine how it's going to feel. The culmination of nearly two decades of thought and work coming together on that production line next year. Well, Steve, I just want to say, and I really do mean this, I think I speak for a lot of people in that the Aptera, back when I first discovered and so many other people discovered in 2007, 2008, 2009, it really inspired a lot of us to start thinking about electric vehicles in a fundamentally different way and take them seriously before the Roadster was even really out on the road or the Tesla Model S. It got me interested in electric vehicles for the first time. And so I'm really excited about where Aptera is going next. It was such a pleasure to talk with you today because your vehicle and your company has been such an inspiration for me and has set me on a trajectory in terms of the vehicle I drive today. So thank you so much for your time and thanks for the work that you and your company are doing. Michael, it's a real honor. Uh, this has been a great interview. I've really enjoyed the questions, enjoyed the dialogue, and I'm so pleased to have this interview with somebody that's been a fan for so long. So it's my pleasure to be here, and we look forward to having you here at Aptera one day to ride and see and hopefully own one of our production vehicles. Oh, man. Ah, you're getting me excited, Steve. All right, well, with that, I'll have to let you go, but now I'm going to be daydreaming about that all day. So thanks so much for your time. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Michael McCallaghan for the interview on Steve Frambo and um, Steve for letting us know all the wonderful things that come into play with the Aptera that you come out with and helping us all get excited for when Aptera is going to come out. We know that this is going to be game changing because you're simplifying everything and that just makes it so easy for us to want to join in and becoming a part of your family. So Thank you once again for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And now we're going to go up to the accelerator program and see what's going on there. Here on the leaderboard, we have... All right, look at that jump. Oh my goodness, it's up to 428 investors. 6.05 million dollars and like i said for this month this is going to jump up pretty good this is really going to start going up pretty fast and everybody's going to start lobbying and pushing and getting their way in trying to get uh, up in the top 10 spot no doubt but it looks like uh, rp is still number one and uh, GZ is number two, JB is three, GT is four, and MB is five, and PG is six. So yes, this was really looking good, really looking good. And if you wanna invest in Aptera, this is the website to go to right here, and you can invest in getting, of course you have to put down $10,000, and this does not go towards the vehicle. This is only investing in 10,000 shares, which uh, comes with a risk. So I have to warn you, I am not a financial advisor. You need to talk to your own financial advisor to make sure that's what you want to do. But uh, if you do want to get the, um, if you want to get the vehicle and get $30 off, you can go to this link right here that I'm showing you on the picture here, this link. And that will take $30 off the down payment. It's a $100 down payment, and you only have to put down 70 by using this link. And you can design your app turret the way you want. So yes, this is the wave of the future. This is gonna be the new paradigm shift. This is the Tesla in the making and if you want to get on board, this would be the best time to do it. The best time. So once again, I got to say hi to all my patrons. You guys are awesome. Uh, continue to support my channel and I'm going to keep you up to date. And if you're new here, please subscribe, ring the bell, hit the like button, and you'll get all my new videos when they come out. All right, you guys are awesome. Once again, y'all take care. We'll catch you on the next one. You have a good day. Bye-bye.